So uh, we'll, we'll kick it off here. Thank you all so much. We know uh, time uh, is everything. And so we know, uh, obviously, in the world right now, there's so many challenges uh, across the spectrum of challenges. And so joining us, and so first off, we'd say just going through a fellowship uh, application process or sort of deciding next steps in your career is stressful at any time and probably more so at this time. And so we're, uh, we recognize that and are appreciative of all of you spending some time with us. And we're so appreciative of all the people as we went through this same similar process uh, a couple of years ago, uh, the amount of people who spent their time with us uh, reviewing applications and looking over resumes and giving us advice and taking time, we always said we would pay that back. And so this uh, is part of that. Um, so again, thank you so much for spending a little bit of time here tonight. Feel free to continue to reach out to us um, as the process goes on and as you have questions after tonight. Uh, so we'll both introduce ourselves really quick. We're going to give a, a couple of disclaimers uh, after that, and then we'll jump into seven questions. We put out a fellowship application guide uh, about a year ago uh, and got 200 something, a couple hundred responses uh, with questions of here's what I'm looking for from a, a standpoint of feedback and advice. And so we'll go through the top seven of those questions, uh, and then we'll open it up to your, uh, the hi moms and the we hear you's in the chat boxes. Uh, we'll open it up to your questions uh, after that. So first, I'm Alex Mearsberger. I did a uh, Master of Public Health and Healthcare Administration at the University of Utah. Uh, at that time, it wasn't a CAMI accredited program, so it's a semi-newer uh, healthcare administration program. And so I was uh, very stressed uh, because all I knew in the world was administrative fellowships. That's sort of the only thing that was in my brain of that's the only job post-graduation from a healthcare administration program. So I ended up applying to 40 or so fellowships, um, I'm probably embarrassed to say the real number. And then it was, there wasn't a single application process. And so it was mailed uh, applications. Uh, and I was super mad at how much I had to pay for postage and just printing out the uh, transcripts and all of that was, was a nightmare. I uh, was really fortunate to get a bunch of phone interviews, uh, a couple uh, on-site interviews, and then ended up uh, at Guys in Your Health System did two years on the clinical side in hospital operations, most, mostly in orthopedics, and then transitioned over to Geisinger Health Plan on the insurance side, where I led our consumer focus and uh, goal of having a top 10% net promoter score um, among the health industry. And so worked with a lot of tech companies and a lot of startups thinking through how do we deliver a better sort of individualized experience for our health plan members. Uh, left there to join an exceptional experience department uh, in the strategy division of Blue Cross North Carolina. I uh, was there for about a year and then just recently joined in December of last year, SAS, the uh, private global analytics company based in Raleigh, North Carolina. So live in Raleigh. Um, and uh, Antoine and I met during a fellowship and created the Advancement League a couple of years ago and have run events and partnerships and have uh, tried to turn it into a quasi healthcare professional association. We'll have more sort of on that later as well. Awesome. Thanks, Alex. And this is uh, Antoine Williams. If you follow me on Instagram, it's at AD Williams. Um, I, I, I am currently in Orlando, Florida, but as Alex mentioned, had a chance to uh, be accepted to the fellowship at the Geisinger Health System. I always like to describe it as the middle of nowhere, Pennsylvania. Technically Danville, but if you've ever been there, you would describe it as the middle of nowhere. Um, I did my master's at the University of Central Florida, similarly to Alex. Um, I had no idea what a fellowship was. Um, I found out about three months into my program by a good friend, um, the dear who's, who's still a good friend today. Um, over the course of the graduate program, had a chance to apply to over 30 fellowships and um, had about 10 phone interviews and two on sites. And when I tell you I didn't envision myself um, ending up anywhere near the snow or anywhere near central Pennsylvania, I say that um, in full confidence. Nonetheless, it turned out to be um, an amazing experience. I joined the fellowship, met Alex, met a cohort of great people. I had a chance to work on a number of community-based uh, projects oversee um, a few service lines um, within our division of medicine and also our anesthesia service line. So I had a chance to get some really in-depth 
um, operational experience in addition to projects and learning from an amazing preceptor. Um, and from there, I actually stayed in Pennsylvania and took a role as director of emergency medicine, overseeing all of our emergency departments within our central uh, region. So spent a lot of time on back roads, a lot of time building our emergency medicine service line and trying to decrease wait times with um, under the leadership of Dr. Feinberg, who now oversees Google. Since then, I have moved to Orlando, Florida, uh, currently as an allied health administrator. So that would be, you know, your executive director. Um, we have about 300 FTEs and oversee um, about seven uh, different services. So that's the, the technical piece. You'll never hear me um, describe myself or say those technical terms out in the real world, but just wanted to give you all some flavor about how the fellowship can really help you build a foundation and do some cool things, uh, both within healthcare and outside of healthcare, like we're doing with the Advancement League. So happy to have you all here. Um, Alex mentioned questions, so we'll kind of use those to frame the conversation. Um, the questions will cover really the entire spectrum, individuals that are applying to fellowships, folks that may be interested and have already started doing research, and then folks that may be starting fellowships um, or currently in fellowships. So again, as we mentioned, as we started to promote the event, this will be a, a widespread conversation um, and we hope to touch on kind of the full spectrum of the journey. So with that being said, the first so, question, yep. disclaimers. Oh, I was gonna give a couple of disclaimers. Yeah. Um, so the, the very so we got three so first disclaimer is you don't have to take anyone's advice um, and that includes ours uh, quick story i loved my personal statement that i wrote uh, for uh, fellowship applications and i had one of my professors at the university of utah was literally invited to the white house for uh, some presidential medal of writing uh, so she's an award-winning writer and marketer and she basically wrote the first paragraph, uh, the sort of hook to my personal statement. I, I was struggling with it and said, I need your eyes on it. And she literally basically wrote it. Um, and when I showed it to friends or strangers or people that would give their time and give feedback, everybody wanted to change it. And so the moral of the story is no matter how good you feel your resume is or application or uh, personal statement, cover letter, all of that type of stuff, people are going to want to give advice and people are going to say hey, change this word or don't use that story uh, we're just here to say you don't have to take our advice you don't have to take anyone's advice at the end of the fellowship application process you don't want to have the feeling that oh i change if, if it happens that you don't end up in the fellowship that you wanted or in any fellowship and you feel like oh i changed all of my application process and it didn't reflect sort of the stories i want to tell or tell or who i am or was um, that's a much worse situation to be in than to feel like this is my best, uh, this is the part of me that comes across the best in the application material. So you don't have to take anyone's advice, disclaimer number one. Disclaimer number two, you never know what organizations are looking for. And so not to play into the prestige world, um, but it just another personal story. So applied to a, a million fellowships, uh, there were some very quick no's and some drawn out yeses and everything in between but for example I, I had sort of a structure where i said these are my long shots and just by whatever health rankings you want to believe i said here's the top couple health fellowships or healthcare organizations that i know of so a cleveland clinic or a mayo clinic or whatever just we know by name um, and i applied to those as sort of long shot scenarios and then i applied to like pick a state and I'm sorry if anybody's from there, but we'll say Kentucky, uh, like University of Kentucky or some random hospital in a state that I had never been there. And I literally, I think it was University of Kentucky. I didn't even receive like a thank you for applying and we're gonna look at it over next steps. It was like within a half hour of submitting, like paying for the application and sending it over. It was just like, no. <laughs> and uh, uh, was fortunate to go to the Mayo Clinic and to some other places on site to interview. And so you just never know what organizations are looking for. And so don't take it personally as you apply places and get different decisions. You just don't know what their criteria is. Um, and it's nothing against you. Third disclaimer is uh, as much as we're, we feel fortunate that our path included a fellowship, we think the healthcare world has changed and is changing so dynamically and so rapidly. 
that you're going to do incredible uh, and healthcare needs you in any uh, category and organization and time and place. Um, you're going to find what works for you. And we're so excited to follow you and learn from you um, and stay in touch with you as uh, fellowships work out or not. We think there's so many great leaders that we see and meet that don't even know still fellowships exist. And so it's just a huge wide world out there. And so to make an impact within healthcare, uh, this is not the be all end all by any means or any stretch of the imagination. So three disclaimers, you're going to do great. We can't wait to talk about it. We're here to talk all things fellowship tonight. Um, and we can talk all things other things uh, another time if you'd like as well. Love that. Love that, Alex. If I had to apply a, a tagline to it, it would be perspective um, over advice. This is certainly, you know, based on our experiences, our biases and our conversations and things of that nature from over the last few years. So definitely take it um, with a grain of salt, apply it to what works for you. And um, no doubts that you will continue to push up over, over everything and make uh, make the best uh, that healthcare can be. So first com question will definitely lay the foundation and that is, should I do a fellowship? So um, for those individuals that are either on the fence or currently applying or their mentor told them that fellowships were their only route, um, uh, the question constantly came up of, should I even do a fellowship? Um, and the answer is, you know, it really depends. Um, we think fellowships in our experience have been great for two uh, types of people. Uh, one, those who have no idea what they want to do in healthcare. So, you know, one prime example is Alex and I, I'll never forget the first series of, of meetings that we had as fellows. It was three of us, Alex, myself, and an individual who's still uh, with Geisinger by the name of Dan Landisberg. Um, and as we were going through these sessions together, all three of us, I remember Alex and I looking over to each other like, wow, like we're really open to doing anything. You know, we were willing to do process improvement, operations. You can throw us in supply chain management. We really just wanted to learn and, and be a part of a fellowship, which is not necessarily a bad thing or a good thing. Um, and then the second is those who know they want to stay in an organization for five plus years. So throughout this whole conversation, we're going to be very frank and very real and, and just hopefully apply some straight talk to it. Uh, so by that, those who know they want to be in an organization for five plus years, a fellowship is a great way to um, really, you know, I will say, you know, beat the system or to um, give yourself a, a two year jump. Uh, what we've learned and the numbers speak for themselves, the story speaks for themselves. When you do a fellowship, you have a superb, unique opportunity to get a bunch of information, a bunch of experience and a great deal of connections in a short period of time. And usually what that means is a two year jump on salary, a two year jump on the opportunity. So you have an opportunity to really um, get a bunch of stuff in a short period of time and jump. As we think about you know, folks that fellowships might not be right for. Um, we've seen that they aren't great for those who have a life passion for one particular area of healthcare. So if you know, just talk to an individual today who's doing an internship at the Orlando Health where I work now, and he said, you know what, I know 100% I want to do practice management. I know a guy that knows a guy who's about to hire a, a regional practice manager. Should I go that route or should I go the fellowship route? If you know for a fact that you want to work in cancer care or you have a passion for behavioral health care, um, you know, our perspective is that you should probably jump into it and, you know, really immerse yourself with an experience like that because a fellowship does allow you to kind of get a broad scope of experience. And then the second is uh, those with a personality trait that are, you know, done with education. So if you've jumped and got two bachelors and you're in your second master's and you're kind of, you know, done learning, you're ready to get and start working. Um, the fellowship does have an educational component. You know, folks start journal clubs. You're still kind of working directly with your preceptor um, to teach other individuals. And after you progress from the first year to the second year, you automatically almost become a unofficial um, mentor. So that's kind of the highlight of that. Um, talk kind of fast, but just so you all know, sessions of me are recorded. We'll also send a detailed recap, but if you're thinking about a fellowship, um, those are some key points that we want to touch on. And feel free as I talk to drop questions in, we'll, we'll touch them. Alex? 
Yeah, I love this. Love seeing some of the questions come in and we're going to get to them um, after these first seven. So question number two, what should I look for in an organization offering fellowships? So first part, very individual specific, uh, things like location, salary, um, just opportunities and years. So one versus two or rotation based versus project based. There may be something in your life that says I need for certain geographic reasons, I have to be in this general area or a certain distance from a family member or from a certain place. Salary, obviously there's uh, a few that post their salary and you can sort of talk to some people within that, but your individual need, need might vary. And for some reasons and some opportunities, uh, you might have to say no. Uh, it could be the dream fellowship, but just isn't going to work in that city at that time and that place for that money. Um, and then years, there's one year versus two year fellowships. You might have a, a decision to make there. Uh, we both did two year fellowships. I just like Anton said, I actually had truthfully no idea of what I wanted to do. Um, and even at the end of the second year, I was still sort of on the fence. Somebody asked the question, when did you start looking for opportunities post fellowships? Uh, we know a, a good friend of ours sort of lasted uh, three or so years in a two year fellowship, uh, just sort of dragging out that time frame um, of when you really had to make some of the decisions and moved into sort of interim work and things. And so uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, two years was right for me versus some people who I know what I want to do. And I'm just using this as that stepping stone for her exactly where I want to be one years. The second part is sort of more general. Um, what to look for in an organization. I would look for organizations that have areas you already may be leaning towards. Um, and I know that sort of contradicts that if you don't know what you want to do in healthcare, but you, even if you don't know everything you want to do, you may know something you want to do. So if you're, uh, if in graduate school, sort of health policy or medical education really stuck out for you and you started to become passionate about, I want to change the way uh, medical schools operate and the way they teach and things like that's just in the back of my head, I would look for organizations that were affiliated with or owned or partnered with medical schools because i know as part of my application process and as part of sort of my onboarding to the fellowship i would be able to say i don't know what i want to do but i do know i want to have some exposure to the medical school or some exposure to health policy and so i would find some aspect of an organization that has what i'm already leaning towards because if i want to if i am leaning to something outside of a hospital and I apply only to specifically very hospital centric fellowships, it's just, it's a harder sell from yourself to that organization to say, I'm all in on this, even though during the interview, it's going to come up, your passion lies in something that they don't offer. So first part, uh, very individual. There's a couple factors within an organization um, that may, based on location, salary, years, or type of fellowship rotation based or projects that matter. Second part, look for organizations that you already may be leaning towards or that have components they may be leaning towards. Awesome. Question number three, how do I stand out in the application process? And I think this also touches on a question that we got about deciding how personal it will be in your personal statement. And the short answer is just by being yourself. There's no one that can be you uh, better than you can. Um, and if we're given a longer answer, I would say, again, touching on the personal statement, and even when you get in your interview, stories are great. Um, specifics are great. Being sincere is great. Um, and reaching out to current and past fellows at the organization is great. Um, a lot of folks don't know that in your first year, in addition to all of your projects and the great work that you'll be doing, the unofficial role is that you're in charge of screening and essentially working as a two to three person recruitment team for the next year fellow. So you are the first line of defense at most organizations, you're reviewing the applications, et cetera. So with that being said, if you're looking to do a fellowship, most of their information is on the website, public, um, even though they don't have much time, they're required to answer your phone calls, to answer your questions, to help you understand the current organization, um, just to give you a leg up and in that process, as Alex and I have reviewed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of applications as fellows and even um, in our free time now as you know, individuals working in healthcare, we've seen both ends of the spectrum, individuals that are essentially the number one fellow 
They've been interning since they've been in their junior year in, in high school. Their dad is a CEO at the local hospital. They have a ton of connections. They were bred to be um, leaders in healthcare, all the way to individuals who have been solid in school and class, haven't had enough time to do a ton of internships, have worked two to three um, jobs to, to stay afloat, but really still has that passion. Um, in both of those scenarios, we've seen folks not only get fellowships, but also excel and secure their dream job post-fellowship. Um, so that being said, um, you can really put yourself in either of those scenarios, regardless of your situation, by being extremely sincere. Um, and to an extent, as personal as you can be in your statement, if a hospital that you worked at saved your life as a child um, and you truly want to repay society by being an administrative fellowship, um, talk about that. If you know you have a real reason to work at that organization based on the mission, vision, and values that aligns to a family member losing their life or a traumatic accident, those are the kind of stories and personal testaments that really stand out in the application process. Um, so personal, genuine, and being sincere, I think will set yourself apart. We've seen that time and time again be successful. Um, the next number two is that trying counts. Um, you really, really, really want to work, but there, you know, you didn't contact anyone at the organization ever. Um, you didn't take us up on an offer to reach out to the first year fellows. Um, you didn't write folks on LinkedIn or try to make genuine connections. Um, you didn't visit the, the hospital if you're in a local market or while you were traveling there to get a feel for the culture. And again, that leads to your um, opportunities to do stories. We live in a social media age and a visual age. Most of the CEOs and major healthcare systems are doing interviews. They're posting on YouTube. They're trying to make sure that the, the nation and the world can see them. So watching two to three interviews will immediately give you a leg up um, for the application as well as the interview. Doesn't mean that you need to dissect everything, but having some of those tidbits during that process really helps you stand out. Um, we talked about being you. Um, and number four is pink polka dots. Um, if they ask you to submit something, um, a form, finding a way to stand out is, is exceptional. Um, but be sure to pay attention to the details of the application process. If they ask you not to provide a cover letter, please, please do not provide a cover letter. Um, as a personal example, I applied to, like I said, over 20 to 30 fellowships. And with that large number comes a lot of room for error. I applied to Mainline Health in Pennsylvania, the top of my personal statement, said Nicholas Children's down in Miami. As you can imagine, I didn't make it very far in that process. So repetitiveness is good. A lot of these applications are taking things directly. So attention to details, um, having folks read over your things and, and, and really really paying attention will, will keep you um, in good standings. And then be you, again, be you part two. Uh, we're extremely serious about this, that it deserves two spots on this five point list. Every step of the process, you have to think like you're actually going to work at the place you're applying. Um, you have to envision yourself in that culture. You have to be honest with yourself. If you interview with three individuals and you can't stand them or you, you're, you don't get good vibes, then we would suggest not moving on with that process because you're going to have one, two, and maybe more years um, with that organization. So you want to make sure that it's the right fit for you and, and truly is the right fit um, for how you're feeling. Nicholas, I'm, uh, so I am personally <laughs> glad that uh, Anton's process worked out the way it did. Right. Um, yeah. But we all, but what he said is so true. So many of the first year fellows become the interview process or at least the first screening round. And so it really is, it's, uh, you just throw people that have no right screening applicants um, and no sort of great background in that uh, and you throw them into screening applicants. And so the easiest thing in the world as just a first round is if we asked for three cover letter or three uh, letters of recommendation and you only include two, it's just like one less person's application that we have to read. 
Um, and if you ask for two cover letter or one cover letter and they send like six, it's again, it's just that very easy criteria decision. So it really is important to whatever they ask, send it how they ask. Um, just gets you a little bit past the, the first part of it. Question four, how do I get past the dreaded phone interview? So first off, uh, and I think I've seen a, a couple questions come through on the chats of just why uh, why is it so necessary to apply to so many fellowships? Um, it absolutely isn't necessary, although it does, uh, like I said in the disclaimers, uh, you never know what organizations are looking for. And so you may be the perfect candidate or you may feel that you're the perfect candidate for this perfect hospital because of location and you know everyone. And for whatever reason, they're just not looking for the experience that you offer or for cultural fit, there might be something there. And so applying to more interviews in our world just bettered the odds uh, that we were going to get it. But absolutely, there's no requirement out there that says you should go crazy and apply to 50 fellowships. You can probably spend your time uh, doing a lot more meaningful things. Uh, but if the fellowship is your goal, uh, like Anton said, that trying, um, if you got to sort of ask yourself in all aspects of life how bad you want things. Um, and so if it is the number one thing that you want, applying to more fellowships and spending more time talking to current fellows and going through that process, obviously, uh, just increases your, your lottery odds a little bit higher. Uh, so getting to the phone interview, uh, first off, there's a congratulations because uh, fellowships are just insanely competitive. Uh, it was competitive, I guess, back a couple of years ago when we applied. And it seems like every year, we said this actually, um, immediately after starting our fellowships in July and then being on the interview panel, when we received all the applications, we were like, oh, there's no, we were, I, me and Antoine were sitting in an office together. We were like, oh, like, there's no way we'd be fellows this year. Um, and I think that happens every year. Like people just get so much incredibly better at the way they volunteer and the way they write resumes and the way they have uh, better grammar in their personal statements, all of it. Um, so just getting to the phone interview round deserves to be celebrated. Um, but a couple of sort of tips on phone interviews, you can probably see these all over the internet. It might be nothing new, but uh, some stories. So I remember I did my fellowship interview for Geisinger. I remember I, um, my wife and I had a young child, uh, like a one-year-old little baby in grad school. And uh, she, we, we lived in a small basement apartment and uh, you couldn't leave our bedroom to wake her up or you'd wake her up uh, at any time of night. And so I had to sleep upstairs on a couch so that I could leave out the front door at like 5.30 in the morning because the only phone interview slot available on the East Coast was at eight in the morning. Um, and so I had to sleep on a couch, walk out a door, get in a car because it was the only quiet place. And I drove over to a little park because I knew no one would be there. And so I was like, 5.30 in the morning, I'm sitting in a car uh, with notes and things. So I think there's just a couple thoughts of, around that. But one, a quiet place that you, I literally had already tried out that park to make sure that my phone worked, to make sure that that time of day was going to be quiet. So just, uh, I, I don't think a car is the ideal place, but if you know the sort of setting that you're going to have and the time that you'll have for that phone interview, having a setting where you know your phone has cell phone service and you know it's going to be quiet and you know you won't be interrupted and all of those things, obviously important. Uh, taking notes, I think, is a very underrated phone uh, opportunity, phone interview opportunity. Um, even here, I, I have some notes written down and you see me on video and so I'm like awkwardly looking down. But if you're just on a phone call, having notes is like a game changer because you don't have to think. Uh, no matter how much you have contacted that organization or have friends within that organization fellowship, 100% you're, you're gonna forget someone's first or last name or you're gonna fumble the exact word of the department that you're so excited to get to know and get to work for. And so having notes just takes your mind a little bit off that autopilot where you can look down real quick and say, it's the orthopedic department that I'm really serious about. And I met Dr. So-and-so um, and you don't have to sort of scan your brain for, for words and names. Um, practice, I think, is is important. Um, you can call us uh, before your phone interviews. We'll set up some times. You can call friends, your mom. I know I said hi, mom, in, in the chat. Um, 
but seriously, anybody uh, that can just ask you a question of, hey, tell me about yourself, and hey, why do you want to work for this organization? I think the more you can start to articulate it and just feel comfortable saying quick snippets about your life and about your experience and about your why um, becomes just easier. And the more you sort of talk about it, the more your brain helps put in place uh, what's true and what's really motivating you. You start to find new words and things. Um, so taking notes, practicing, finding the right space. Um, and then the second two, I think, be you, or the last two, um, be you. Uh, we, we said noticing a theme here. All of uh, the advice that we have really comes down to being yourself. If you love telling stories, tell a story. If you're brief, be brief. If you're funny, be funny. Uh, whoever, whatever you are, be you. Uh, the right organization, the right timing, they'll appreciate you, they'll develop you, they'll reward you. Uh, it'll all work out as long as you are who you are. Uh, and they'll see that. Uh, and then the last one is be kind. Um, so the only time that we're ever advocates of not being yourself is if you're not nice. Uh, interviewers have a hard job. So they're so interestingly, some of the fellowship preceptors, they're trying to stand out in their roles. Uh, they're trying to take another job or move on in their career. They're trying to find someone to help move their organization forward. They're meeting dozens of candidates. They may be dealing with sort of their personal lives and real life problems and all of the challenges. So thanking them for their time, for their insights, for their interest, um, thanking people and being kind and being yourself, I think really does go a long way. Um, and that includes with the other candidates that you may be lumped into group phone interviews with or different things. But um, so taking notes, practicing, identifying the space that you're going to do it in and then being yourself and being kind, all important. Awesome. Awesome. So I have a few more questions and then we'll, we'll hit the chat box. I see a lot of, a lot of great questions and some, some flavorful commentary there. So looking forward to get to that. Question five is, is two part. Uh, how can I be a better candidate? And how do I transition into a more senior role or lead people? Um, so the answer is, First off, wow, a, a two-part question, and there were a number of these as we kind of filtered through um, the comments from our, our fellowship guide. Uh, but first, I want to start with a story. So once upon a time, a, a few years ago, we created uh, an event called the uh, the Young Health Leader Summit, where we charge roughly $1,000, um, about nine ninety nine to be exact, for a three-day registration to the event. And we've had hundreds of tens um, in cities from across the world. Um, in a, a couple of countries outside of America. Um, we get emails every year from people who want a discount. Um, and here's often how those email exchanges go. So I'll, I'll step into my performing arts uh, experience here. So random person, can I come to the event, but just pay only $50? We reply, can you do something for us that's equal in value to the remaining $950? Random person, so I can attend for $50 or no? Us, what? Wait, what? Uh, so that's one story. And here's the second story. Um, again, once upon a time, we held the Young Health Leader Summit for that same $1,000 in San Francisco. Uh, Chelsea Perry, the name may ring a bell, wanted to attend the event, but Kaiser didn't have the budget to pay full price for brand new administrative fellows. Chelsea convinced 10 of her fellow fellows from different regions within Kaiser to attend. She then emailed us and said, hey, I talked to 10 of my peers into attending and sharing with their networks. And Kaiser has agreed to pay if there is a 20% discount for us all. Can we attend? Us. Yes. And yes. And another yes. Please work with us, Chelsea. In case you missed the moral of the story, be like Chelsea Perry, not like the random person. Chelsea is now our head of membership. She's been that for a couple of years. She's um, hopefully she'll tell you that she's gotten a lot from the events, but leave. But more than that, she's delivered a ton of value. Um, she's an individual that's proactive. Uh, she finds solutions and presents them. Um, so as you think about those two scenarios, one way to be a better candidate, um, a better leader, uh, a better leader, a better friend even a, a better significant other is to find ways to make a difference without being asked. Um, another moral of the story is that occasionally we say yes to that random person who asks for a discount. 
um, one of our preceptors, Tom Sokola, um, who was most recently the um, CEO of the Geisinger Medical Center in Danville, Pennsylvania. And he had a quote, um, he had a number of quotes, but one of them uh, was that if you don't ASK, you don't GET. Um, so continue to do the work, continue to be yourself. But if you're not willing to ask questions as candidates, ask questions when you're in your fellowship, um, in big meetings, um, you'll never you know, get those answers. You'll never get that experiences. You'll never get more money, um, so on and so on. Um, so with that being said, a number of examples is that you can shadow administrative fellows from different organizations. Um, you can do a host of things, but if we don't leave you with anything, if you don't ASK, you will never GET. So be bold, continue to ask questions, and be Chelsea Perry. Don't be the random person that um, asks without offering any value. And sing. So question six. <laughs> And sing? Yeah, that was uh, my performance art. Oh, and sing. Oh, because you and got, sing. yeah, yeah. That, uh, that was pretty solid acting, I thought. <laughs> I was about to jump in and be the random person. Yeah. Um, it, that, should be, uh, that should be the quote, when you have a chance to be Chelsea Perry, be, be Chelsea Perry. Awesome. Um, so question six, and then seven, and then we'll get to all these chat questions. This is awesome. So real quick, uh, question six, how can I improve my presentation and appearance for interviews? So. First, we'd like to say maybe your presentation and appearance is already perfect for the right organization just the way it is. Um, again, on the, the BU, not everyone is going to appreciate everything. For one organization, you may be too put together. For another, you may be not put together enough. Um, and so it just sort of depends on the type of organization uh, and the type of culture that you're sort of walking into. Uh, you can be the very same level of put together and have vastly different experiences in two organizations. So everyone's different. As long as you're being you, you're going to be right for someone and vice versa, they'll be right for you or not. Um, and you may find that out after you get the fellowship and then you just keep searching for the right opportunity and the right people. Um, part two answer, there is a saying that confidence is everything. And while we don't agree that it's everything, it's definitely something. Uh, so Michael Jordan had his trusted UNC shorts under his uniform uh, every game for the Chicago Bulls and felt like it gave him an edge. Uh, so we're big proponents to find your edge for the interview, whether it's phone interview or in-person interview. Um, I have a pre-interview uh, ice cream routine. Uh, I have a pre a lot of things ice cream <laughs> routine. <laughs> I just enjoy ice cream. Um, I've made Antoine walk uh, very far, very late at night to get ice cream in random cities across America, as we've done the Young Health Leaders Summit and other sort of adventures on behalf of the Dance League. We, uh, we find a Ben and Jerry's for me, uh, most places. I also have a special pair of shoes uh, that only leaves the box for interviews. Uh, they're not like super expensive shoes or anything, but literally I've had them for seven years and they've only left the box for job interviews, for in-person job interviews. So from every single job I've got, uh, the fellowship, um, the health plan, Blue Cross North Carolina and SAS had the exact same uh, in the box shoes that I break out only for that day. Um, so whether it's a brand new shirt, ice cream, uh, shoes in the box, find a way to feel your best for the interview. And if it's if you're more casual, uh, obviously there's going to be an organization that says, hey, you have to come to our, or our interviews in a tuxedo or in a formal dress. Um, and you got to sort of go along with that. But if they say, hey, this is our culture, here's who we are, we want you to be comfortable being who you are, and maybe everyone wears ties, but you decide to not wear a tie, or maybe everyone wears dresses and you decide to be a little more casual. Um, I think the world rewards you for being you. And so if you're most comfortable and most confident and feel like you're yourself, uh, go and be that person and uh, it all works out the way it should. So question seven, and then we're, uh, this is exciting. I'm uh, digging through this chat. First off, I would like to say on the chat, somebody said, and, and I quote, first, I would like to thank Alex Marisberger. And so we're starting with that chat question because flattery was that really in there. <laughs> oh, I see. It. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure you paid them or they sent you ice cream. No, I'm just kidding. Alex is awesome sometimes. 
Question Questions. seven. Are you, are you taking this one? Yeah, yeah. So how should I treat the other candidates in a virtual or inside group interview when I know I'm competing with them? <laughs> Fight so. Yeah, right. So a duel. Wins. Grill them. Don't look yep. at them in the eyes. Um, no friends. But no, in all seriousness, we've, you know, some of the folks that we've interviewed with, we still stay in touch with. They support our events. We support them. So we really have an opportunity to make questions. And in theory, some of them are going to be your future colleagues. So first answer is that in all seriousness, they're just as nervous as you. Um, they're trying to, to find a fit just like you. And you know, in all seriousness, they may be dealing with personal or family issues greater than anything you've ever experienced in this life. Um, from some of the conversations that we had while interviewing and even post getting the job, I think we've learned a ton to Alex at this point um, by being kind um, and leading with our heart and just knowing that that is a trait that won't limit you from your greatest potential and your greatest success. Um, in, in, in reality, many individuals may need that specific opportunity more than you. Um, and on that same note, they may have wanted it more than you. Um, so again, you should treat them with exceptional kindness. You should cheer for them. Uh, you should learn from them. And you should never cut them off or try to upstage to them. And that's one of the pillars of, of our organization. Morally, that's something that Alex and I both share. Uh, from an ethics standpoint and keep in mind that you know these individuals that you meet as you interview in, in different places across the country will most likely be your first out of school kind of healthcare network um, they may be your future colleague your future boss uh, your investor or even team member at some point so as you enter um, fellowship interviews and, and applications with you know, the GOAT mentality and the, you know, competitive edge and, you know, whether you wear your shorts, UNC shorts or have ice cream, just remember to, to be kind to root for others and, and know that that won't limit your success. Yeah, I love that, uh, the cheer for the, uh, the others aspect of it. I think uh, our sort of mantra from a, uh, whatever the opposite of a scarcity mentality is that, uh, or all the quotes, the rising tide rises all ships or whatever. Um, I'm terrible with quotes, uh, but <laughs> I, genuinely, I genuinely care um, and genuinely try to be kind. I think if you see someone uh, that gets the fellowship over you and that's their dream, I think the more you can cheer for them and be excited for them and uh, love them to the, the extent you can, uh, the better your career in life is going to be because they're going to, in turn, just like Antoine said, they may be your boss, you may be their boss at some point. It all sort of comes full circle and you'll rely on that network so much that I think the more we can be excited for the success of others, the more success comes to us. Um, and so we're going to jump into your questions. I don't know how to do this. There's so many of them and I start from the uh, top. am so excited about that. 